Well, this evening, we want to continue our study of the book of John, the Gospel according to John. The last time we were together, we covered through the first chapter. There are a few things I would remind you of about our study. When we study John, we're studying evidences that prove that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. As I said the last time together in our study, uh, John doesn't follow the same pattern as Matthew, Mark, and Luke in writing about Christ. Uh, they're called synoptic because they basically start with his birth and go on through his whole life and death and so on. But John doesn't do that. John, as we said, <clears throat> is basically um, apologetic in his approach. And again, I remind you that apologetics is not saying, I'm sorry, I wronged you. It, it comes from the Greek word apologia, which means to make a defense. And Christians are expected to do this. And when Peter said, be ready to give an answer, that word answer translates a form of apologia we're able to say, here's the reason we do this. Here's the reason this is right. Or even here's the reason this is wrong. And since we follow the teachings of the inspired word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, Colossians 3.17 makes it clear that whatsoever we do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. Of course, that means as he has authorized or by his authority. Uh, on the day of Pentecost, when the church began, the people who heard the word were convinced that Christ was the Son of God, asked what they must do, were told as believers, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, you will notice uh, that they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That means by his authority were they baptized. There is a difference I might mention in passing here in what you have in the Matthew's account of the Great Commission. In Matthew 28, beginning verse 18, verses following. Here, Peter in Acts 2 tells them as believers, you must abide in the authority or by the authority of Christ to be saved. And that was that now as believers, you must be baptized, having repented for the remission of your sins. When Jesus said that they were to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's actually into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A little difference in that, and in Acts 2.38, uh, if I baptize by the authority of Christ, then I baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're baptizing someone who's baptized for the remission of sins into a saved, reconciled, justified relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we're noticing then that we're to prove all things, hold fast that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5.21. And basically, John is just saying, God has now asked us to accept Jesus Christ of Nazareth as the Son of God without evidence. And I want us to keep that in mind through everything we do. So John is selecting, as it were, witnesses or presenting evidence to our intellectual ability and asking us to reason to the conclusion that Christ is the Son of God. And he does this all through the book. So the Holy Spirit guides him infallibly to select different ones to be those witnesses or the evidence that all put together proves that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. He is, he said of himself, the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. Now, that's what we've been doing, but to bring our mind back up, I wanted to go over it again. It will be the way we'll approach the whole book as time allows. But I want to do something else tonight before we get into chapter 2. And I want to read from a backup to chapter 2 in verse 15. The Old Testament, what we call one of the minor prophets, Habakkuk, chapter 2 and verse 15. 
The prophet said there, woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that putteth the bottle to him, and maketh him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Well, it's obvious when he says, woe to, to the one that gives his neighbor drink, that he's not talking about water. He's talking about that which can make a, a person, as he says here, uh, drunk, inebriated. And alcohol does that. Uh, every drink you drink of alcohol puts your nervous system a little more to sleep. And your ability to even control yourself uh, more out of your hands. And that's the reason people, when they get real drunk, <laughs> for that way would put it, uh, they uh, can't even remember what they did or they pass out and so on. So it is an intoxicant. What does that mean? It's poison. I think it's interesting. People laugh about it on these television shows and shows. And then sometimes other people say it when they're wanting to offer a drink to somebody to name your poison. Well, they couldn't get it more accurate than that. It is poison. And just about every year, especially in the fall, at the beginning of the fall semester in college, there's some big drinking party going on in a uh, fraternity house, and somebody drinks so much alcohol, the sister can't handle it, and he dies. Well, if we would really think about it, after all of these years, so much said about every kind of drug under the sun, that alcohol is still the chief problem as far as intoxicants and drugs throughout the whole of the nation. So there's a reason I wanted to note this before we get into John chapter 2. That again is Habakkuk 2.15. is because under the law of Moses, if you did this, what he says right here, then uh, you sin against God. If you give your neighbor to drink an intoxicant such as this, that which will make you drunk, the more you take, the drunker you get, because that's the way it works, then you have sin, period. Now, I want you to hold all of that. Habakkuk 2.15, as we get into this part of John's teaching, proving that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Now, we won't read through it, but I'll give you the highlights, and that's the way we'll go down through the whole book as time allows, the Lord willing. We have the record in John 2 of the Lord turning water into wine. Greek word is oinos. There are several different words in the Hebrew and the Greek. The general term for oinos, for uh, wine, is oinos. People today see wine and they automatically think intoxicant. But that was not the way it was when people used oinos, or form of it, in their conversation in the Koine Greek of the first century. Now, could it mean uh, alcoholic beverage? It certainly could, but it didn't necessarily mean so. How did they know when they heard oinos used by somebody or form of it that it was alcoholic or not by the context in which it was put? Uh, so with all of the things being equal, you keep in mind what the law of Moses forbade for the Jews and Jesus, according to the flesh, is a Jew living under the authority of the law of Moses. And he was tempted in every point, like as we are, as the Hebrews writer said, but he didn't sin. That means he didn't violate Habakkuk 2.15. So now we come down to this occasion and we look in some of the social situations of the time, and there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. You'll see that the Lord, his mother, and his disciples had been invited. Thus, they were present participants in the wedding feast. And when the wine gave out, they didn't have any more. The Lord's mother indicated to Jesus that he could do something about the situation. And you'll remember the Jews were very big on their purifying. Thus, there were always in a faithful Jews household, lots of water. And you see there were these big water pots, about six of them, and they were available there. And the Lord instructs the servants to fill them to the, to the brim, actually, is the way it means. And then the Lord said, once they were filled, draw out 
And then you take it to the one who managed the whole affair. We might call him the head waiter. And when he tasted of the water, which had become wine, uh, he wanted to know where it came from. And he called the bridegroom. He said to him, uh, it's not customary to give the best after people are well drunk and you give the best at first and then give the worst afterward. Uh, I think it's interesting that if they'd been inebriated, they wouldn't have known really what was, quote, good, unquote, wine and what wasn't. They'd been happy just to take in more alcohol because it's the alcohol that has the kicks and, and gives them whatever they're looking for. So he wanted to know why uh, things have been reversed. Now, John was paused here to interject this. The Apostle John explains that this turning the water into wine at the marriage feast in Cana of Galilee was the beginning of our Lord's signs. I want to emphasize S-I-G-N-S, signs. It was a miracle, yes, but a, it wasn't a miracle just for a miracle's sake. It was a sign. It was not a sign of itself. It pointed to something else. And uh, this was the first of the signs that he worked. So first of the miracles that he worked. And this says that he, in doing so, he manifested his glory and his disciples believed on him. Now, many times today, if you hear anything about the Lord turning water into wine, it's somebody trying to say, see, the Lord made wine as we use it to find wine today, and they all participated in it, so it's nothing wrong with drinking alcoholic beverage. Well, one reason I suppose people know only this about that is that ignorance speaks very loud many times. And what we understand here, if we just understand the words that God gave and understand they have meanings and they were used in the context of that time, the Lord didn't do anything that would cause him to break God's will and sin. If he had made that wine alcoholic, he would have violated Habakkuk 2.15. Now, I'd like to see the person who says, oh, I'm a loyal servant of God. I'm a Christian. I believe the authority of the Bible. But I think the Lord made alcoholic wine and gave it to all those folks. Now, you try that and make it harmonize with the plain language forbidding such to any Jew under the law of Moses in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord made grape juice. That's exactly what he did. And we use grape juice today, although back in those days, they would have used wine because it didn't automatically mean alcoholic beverage. Now, somebody may say, well, what about... Uh, you just completely turned off against alcohol completely uh, in any way, form, for any purpose whatsoever? No. Uh, there, you know, I'm not against painkiller. But uh, if you take painkillers just to get whatever they do to you, uh, that's wrong. You're dopehead, for lack of a better way to put it. Uh, you're not following the teachings of sobriety in every way possible christians are commanded to be sober-minded and there's no drunk or any dope head that is sober-minded they're not thinking straight and they made themselves that way or somebody gave them something secretively and they took it and made themselves that way the point is is that the lord made grape juice it was not alcoholic if he had he would have sinned at least by a backup 215, violated it, and he didn't do that. So uh, people shouldn't be appealing to that as authority to drink beverage, alcohol. It is a sign, and we'll see more about that a little later. Now, the next thing that comes up is that the Lord went down to Capernaum, and it was his mother was with him and his brothers and his disciples they all went down and they stayed there the scripture says just a few days then we come to another interesting situation the cleansing of the temple in jerusalem 
Now, it was at the time of the Passover of the Jews that Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Many times I might say this again here when we look at a map and you go up and down the map, we think of going up and down as far as topography is concerned. But anytime you go to Jerusalem from anywhere in the circumference of the place, you're going up to Jerusalem. And that's exactly what they did. They went up to Jerusalem. And there he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, all the things they used to sacrifice under the law of Moses. But he found also money changers. Money changers were there, set up shop, because any of the uh, money that they brought, it was not money of the temple, the shekel, shekel then uh, they had to change it into the currency that was used in the temple. So all of this was set up, and it was, um, I guess you could think of it on Walmarts going on there. When all this stuff was going on, it was a hubbub. There's nothing sanctified about it. There was nothing holy about it. We just all this stuff going on. Well, it upset the Lord, to say the least. He made a scourge of cords and he drove them all out of the temple he drove the sheep out the oxen he poured out the money changers money and he overturned their tables and he told them to take these things out out and uh, stop making his father's house a place of merchandise it never was meant for such a thing as that and they completely had removed what it was meant to be by their wrong activity. Now, there would have been nothing wrong with them having a place outside the temple to help people and supplying for them the proper animals, according to the law, changing their money, but they were set up in the temple. It wasn't meant for that. I think there's a good lesson in this for Christians today, and that is that uh, everything we do is to be holy, is to be by the authority of the Lord, and if by the authority of the Lord is set out in his word, it is holy. And we're saints, or we're set apart, suitable for the master's service by our own obedience to the gospel and being made free from sin. We walk faithful to him in the spiritual temple of God, which is the Lord's church, his family. So under the law of Moses, there was first the tabernacle, where the Jews worshiped through the priests of the tribe of Levi, various ways they did so, which is not for us to study now. Then once the temple was built, they did the same thing there. So they are sacred things, and they had turned the sacred, holy things, sanctified things, into just uh, another day and a place to make money. It's interesting that his disciples recall that it's written, in, and this is, comes from Psalm 69, verse 9, that the zeal of my house hath eaten me up. Well, that's an interesting statement. We've probably run past it too many times. You don't get the import of it. But it wouldn't hurt if a lot more children of God, Christians, those who are of Christ, members of the spiritual temple of God, a place of worship, were eaten up with the zeal of the Lord, that they were could not rest till they performed the will of God, doing what he said and the way he said it, and for the reason he said it. Or there's more than one reason. Remember, our whole duty on earth, according to the inspired ecclesiastical writer, is to fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Now, when he did this, that must have been quite an uproar, no small thing in cleansing the temple. The Jews then challenged him, and they asked, what sign, there's that word again, what sign do you give us, show us, seeing that you do these things? Well, it was at this point that the Lord made a great prophecy. And the predictive element of it is what we're interested in. 
and it was regarding his death and his resurrection. Now, a sign would mean nothing to these Jews or to his disciples until later. The Lord simply said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And John, the apostle, makes it clear that the Lord was talking about the temple of his body, our Lord's physical body. John also adds that after the resurrection, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had spoken. Of course, I've said often, I haven't changed my mind on it, that if I were to do offer any one single solitary evidence that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. He is who he claimed to be, and the Bible says he is. It would be his resurrection from the dead. If Jesus Christ was raised from the dead to die no more, everything else the Bible says about it is right. By implication, that's the case. That's the crowning act and sign. And the Lord was going to do a lot more miracles that would be signs, but he gives this one specifically here is the sign that he's the son of God. Now, during the feast of Passover, that of course at Jerusalem, the Lord did many signs. I think it's interesting that they said, give us a sign. He says, here's the one that crowns all of them. And then he turns around and does many, uh, many signs in Jerusalem at that time. And many at the feast, um, when they beheld the miracles that he did that were signs that pointed to him to be who he claimed to be, the Messiah, the Son of God, believed on his name. <clears throat> However, you'll notice that the Lord at this time, the time this was going on, did not entrust himself to them. I've pondered this, don't know that I'll understand it, but uh, I know what omniscience is, whether I can grasp all of it or not. It means that one who's omniscient, omniscient knows all that is the object of knowledge. And it says of him that Christ knew men and he knew what was in man. He understands the humanness of man better than I think we do. Statements like the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. is not just a comment on an individual person's particular problems or needs. It's a comment on humanness. Now, I joke a lot of times, and I got this years ago from Brother Deaver, and if I were, had thought to ask, I mean, he got it from somebody. When we say, now you be good, you know how you are. Well, <clears throat> a lot of people don't really realize how they are. They don't know how to stay, take stock of themselves from the inside and really see themselves like they need to see themselves. My prayer has always been and continues to be, and yet I still don't know that I uh, I don't think I have a will because of the very nature of the thing. Uh, my prayer is to see myself as God sees me. Well, I am told to examine myself as a Christian, see whether I'm being the faith unless I'm reprobate so I can see enough about myself and having an honest heart as I do so, Luke 8, 15, I can know whether I'm faithful to God or not. I can see sins in my lives that need to be changed or whatever. But when I consider how God knows me, I think of what's said by James, the passage I quote most often in James 1.25, who so looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. I know that if I'm to see myself as God sees me, it'll be because I'll have to be honest with myself 
as I study the Bible, which means I have to learn how to study it. I have to rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. I have to understand how Christ the King gives me his authority in words, and I have to know how to apply them. So I think we have a statement here when it says he, Christ, knew men, and he knew what was in man, that while he knew individual persons and their thinking, their motives, and so on, he also is saying, I know how man is. I know how human you are. <clears throat> I'm glad that we have the second person of Godhead who came in the flesh. As we noticed earlier, as John said, the word became flesh and we beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's why the Hebrews writer can say that he was tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin. And that's why that judgment at the end of time is committed to the Son. Because he is human and understands what it is to be human, to live as a human. And that's very important to understand. So there's a lot more in some of these, maybe, than sometimes just reading over it we, we uh, may not see uh, when we just say he knew man and what was in man. There's a lot there. So let's go back over chapter 2 for just a moment. Just see the facts as they are declared. We see something about the social side of the Lord during his ministry. And that tells us a great deal there at the marriage feast. It shows that he was happy to celebrate when things were properly done, carried out correctly. He was not a wine bibber. He was not a glutton. He was none of those things. It tells us that it's proper and wholesome for us to enjoy social gatherings where everything's done in accordance with God's will. He did, and he's left us an example, not only in how to suffer for being right, but how to live. After all, remember, when Christ came, he came to show us how God will live as he were human, because he became human. And so when we see him doing these things, we know we can participate in like things when they're conducted properly. There's something about his attitude toward marriage I think you see his great stamp of approval by participating in the celebration that resulted from two people marrying acceptably. He accepted the invitation. He attended the wedding. And that's important to understand that he also, that we also should celebrate weddings when they're proper and wholesome and good. We also see that uh, our Lord this is what I said I'd come back to later. Uh, our Lord was is the master of all nature. Everything natural he created. Without him was not anything made that was made, John said. So he is the one who executed the Father's will and created everything, spiritual and physical. And so he turned the water into wine. He turned the water and the wine without sending it through a grapevine into a grape. And he can do that. What is that to him? If he did what he did, and he did the way he did it naturally, creating natural laws, then what is it for him who made the law to change it and speed it up and do it however he wanted to? I think also it shows something about his appreciation for quality. The wine he created was readily noticeable and much better than what had been there. That doesn't mean that what they had finished drinking was bad. Common sense says that at a wedding feast, the nature of such things, your friends and family coming to celebrate it, they put the best out. Even the governor of the feast said that. But what Jesus created could not be better. It was quality. And God is interested in the quality 
of our lives and all things that we do. And one of the things that comes from Colossians 3.17, acting only in accordance with his will or by his authority, is that's the way we become quality, the kind of people that God would have us be. This uh, particular miracle strengthened and caused faith in the Lord's own disciples. And John records that others may consider carefully this same evidence. Remember why this is in this book. Because John, by the Holy Spirit, says here's evidence. And along with all the other evidence, it proves that Jesus is the Son of God. And so he records it as the Holy Spirit guides him. For all scriptures given by inspiration of God, 2 Timothy 2 and 16. Actually, starting with 15 and going all the way through 18. So we need to consider carefully evidence. It's there for a reason. Don't just see a thing happening. I imagine there's a host of people that have read about the Lord doing this, say, well, there's a miracle, and he did it. But they don't understand the significance of it, the sense of it, what it was meant to do and say. And that's true of every one of them in this book. I think it's interesting to see in these miracles, this one in particular, but all the miracles as signs, that there is, there are minute details. And those details forever preclude the possibility of fraud. I think you'll find that there's, even in studying in our Jewish prudent system, uh, evidence that the more detailed the evidence, then the more have to be true. People who lie can't remember the lies they told. And they don't like to get in details because they're apt to forget those and they change and that's how these things happen. Well, when you look further at this, I think of what if we were there beholding the Lord in any of the miracles that you did. They serve to make him majestic, because he is, and his miracles are that way. You see, his very presence was captivating, not because of any physical looks he had, what he said, what he did. And his power was there. Have you ever asked when he did what he did in the temple, why didn't somebody stop him? If you have that kind of uproar in a place like the temple among the Jews, why do they stop him? You have all kinds of things going on there. But it also tells us then that when the Lord sets about to do something, we've had recent studies on providence, that it'll be done one way or the other. And he knows before it ever starts because he's omniscient. He's all powerful. So when the Lord did all these things, it wasn't haphazard. Remember, regarding our conduct, all things are to be done decently and in order. Now, the Lord knew all about this before it ever happened. He couldn't know that every hair, the number of every hair in your head or every sparrow that falls, except that he knows all that is the object of knowledge. It's not that he comes to know anything it's just there. If you have trouble understanding that, well, join the crowd. But I can accept the fact of it. And the Lord, in becoming a man, divested himself of whatever form deity has. Didn't divest himself of deity, but of the form. That's always amazed me. I'd like to know more about that. That there is that which is not material, that is peculiar to God. There's a form of deity but he divested himself of that took upon himself the form of humanity you and me and uh, he came to earth and did as we know he did 
as John is proving here. Thus, he's the example. He is the one to follow. Now, a few more words and we'll close out for that. According to the Apostle John, I've referred to this already, Psalm 69, verse 9, was a prophecy concerning the Christ and his attitude toward his father's house. I've already emphasized this part when we earlier went through the chapter, but there's something wrong with our faith as members of the church, his children, if we're not zealous for the things that pertain to the work of his spiritual family, for the things of our Father, if we're not burning up with zeal to get the Lord's will done. As I look back over the years, I don't know how many members of the church remind me of the water brigade. Anytime anybody wants to get active and see the urgency of Snatching souls out of the fire, and the only way that's done is teaching the gospel, defending the faith. They've got their buckets of cold water to try to put the fervency out. Yeah, well, we can't do that. We don't have this. Well, we can't do that. We don't have that. And I, and I, I don't understand. If God be for us, who can be against us? Well, our own brethren can. Who sold Joseph into slavery in Egypt? Who killed the Lord? Those that certainly should have known better and should have loved him more than anybody else on this earth. And so many times we are our own worst enemies. Of course, there's a wonderful, we want to close out, there's the wonderful prophecy regarding his death and resurrection. And we'll stop there because that's pretty much where the chapter stops. We emphasize that the Lord's many miracles in Jerusalem caused many to believe on his name. Before we end the class, let's go to our Father in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we humbly approach thy throne, thankful for the day, thankful for the time we've had on this earth, praying that whatever time we have left, we'll be zealous for thy cause, that we will study and we'll learn, we'll practice the truth, have a tender heart that will repent of sins and will teach other people the truth as we can. May we realize how brief and uncertain life in the flesh is and that it won't be long for any of us regardless of chronological age before we depart this world. So, Father, we come to thee the close of a day and study of thy word, thankful for thy love and care and praying that it will be always for us that our faith will be based on thy word that will be greater and greater as time goes on. Then when life's little day is over, we'll be able to come home and be with thee forever. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.